This program is made possible in part by the National Endowment for the Arts and the Rouse Company Foundation. Welcome to The Writing Life. My name is Roland Flint, and I'm uh, here today with three of my predecessors as Poets Laureate of Maryland. We're going to talk a little about The Writing Life, about our laureateships, and we're going to begin by reading a poem each, and we'll read some more poems as we go along. And uh, we'll go in order of appointment. I was appointed in 1995, and uh, I'm still serving, and I begin with a poem called Rosalind October. Twenty years ago, we were entering a new phase of our relationship, my wife and I, and it included moving into a new house. And we're about to do that again. In fact, today is our first official day in the new house. And that's in there, and so is a visit to the National Cathedral. It's called Rosalind October. White my book, I'm back. In the yellow and cinnamon streets of mid-October, the broken golds come down to say, no one wood lies. In autumn we begin again for the last time, and the trees are pulling music from the high wind and from the brightest light all year, Ravel and Mozart from the great masts of the flying trees. So I tell the visiting friend, this must be a gift which I am avid for, to walk from a dark transept to the middle again, to climb the steps at the center of the cruciform in the steep cathedral of longing intro evo and the windy streets fly shining with the buckles of october blues of the change i'm growing through tough dull greens that have bitten down to stay and red and reds are falling down around me so i can hear and smell them red and now the old flower vendor calls out to me these are nice she says yes i'll take them and these are nice i'll take them too and so are these, fine, I'll take them, chrysanthemums, corn marigolds, and ox eye daisies. They say a name I want to hear when hers is crossed with mine. And if we make a house inside this old October's blowing, it's her name too, and she will hear it too. An old poem, but uh, you don't have to follow me and read an old one, Linda. What would you like to start with? Well, I am going to read an old poem. It's about the naming of my daughter when she was born, and she now has two daughters herself. Um, her name is Rachel, which literally means a you, a female sheep. Rachel, we named you for the sake of the syllables and for the small boat that followed the Pequod gathering lost children of the sea. We named you for the dark-eyed girl who waited by the well while her lover worked seven years and again seven. We named you for the small daughters of the Holocaust who followed their six-pointed stars to death and were all of them known as Rachel. It's one of my favorites of yours. Thank you. Uh, Linda served as Poet Laureate from 1991 to 1994. Her predecessor, uh, Reed Whittemore, served from 1985 to 1990. What will you give us, Reed? Well, <clears throat> I'll give you an old poem, too. Uh, this was when I was still fairly new at giving important lectures, and so the lecture was a very important one for me, and I decided I'd uh, indicate how naive I was by starting the lecture with a poem. It's called Today. Today is one of those days when I wish I knew everything, like the critics. I need a bit of self-confidence, like the critics. I wish I knew about Coptic, for example, and Shakti Yoga. The critics I read know them. They say so. I wish I could say so. I want to climb up some big publishing mountain and wear a little skull cap and say so. I know. Confidence, that's what I need to know. And would have if I came from California or New York or France. If I came from France, I could say such things as, Art opened its eyes on itself at the time of the Renaissance. 
If I came from California, I could say Christianity was short-circuited by Constantine. If I came from New York, I could say anything. <laughs> I come from Minnesota. I must get a great big book with all the critics in it and eat it. One gets so hungry and stupid in Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> Too modest, I know that, because I know many of your former students. Uh, uh, Lucille served from, Lucille Clifton served as mm -hmm. Port Laureate from 1976 to 1984. Lucille, what are you going to share with us? Well, this is a poem I don't read very often. I had been a semester in the Deep South, and uh, this was a poem written when I was coming back home. It's called Blake. And I, I was thinking of the idea of Blake seeing angels in the trees. Blake saw them glittering in the trees, their quills erect among the leaves, angels everywhere. We need new words for what this is, this hunger entering our loneliness like birds, stunning our eyes into rays of hope. We need the flutter that can save us, something that will swirl across the face of what we have become and bring us grace. Back north, I sit again in my own home, dreaming of Blake, searching the branches for just one poem. Very nice. Thank you. Well, um, we thought we would talk next a little bit about uh, our laureate ships. Uh, as I say, I was appointed in 1995. Uh, Linda and Lucille, I think, were both on the committee that mm -hmm. selected me. Uh, at any rate, my first sign of it was Linda calling. I was at Yaddo at the time and asking me if I would serve if appointed. I think, I think it suggests they didn't want the governor to be embarrassed <laughs> if he appointed me, and I said, no, thanks. Uh, so I, I thought about it uh, and said I would do it. Then I was asked by someone in the uh, office in Baltimore who arranges the readings for the laureate, uh, what I would be willing to do or what I would like to do. And I said I would, as it doesn't pay anything, I would like only, only to go to public institutions that couldn't usually afford a literary program, that I would be willing to go to, therefore, to public schools, to prisons, to old people's homes. And um, the reply came back always via channels. I actually <coughs> didn't sit down with the governor, but I was told the governor wanted to emphasize service to youth at this time. And so I went to public schools. I went almost exclusively to public schools, a couple of exceptions, but I went to uh, at least one public school in all 24 counties mm -hmm. since uh, 1995. I haven't gone for a while, but uh, that's what I did. And I, I gave not long readings, but 30 to 40 minutes, and then talked with, uh, with the students. I also stipulated, again, I had a little leverage, I thought, since I wasn't being paid except the honor, to uh, stipulate that I didn't want any captive audiences. I didn't want to read to any general assemblies. I wanted to read only to students who declared an interest in writing and who wanted such a program. And, uh, and Pretty much the schools observed that. Um, often they had read, the students had read some of my poems. Often they were, the core of the audience was uh, uh, students who wrote. Uh, and uh, it, was fun to, it was fun to read to them and talk with them. So that's what I did, Linda. Well, when I was called, um, it was under Governor Schaefer, they asked me, um, in the initial phone call to recommend people that I thought would be good <laughs> post laureate. So I gave them a nice list of names. Um, and then they said, well, would you consider doing it? And I said, what would you want me to do? And they said, well, would you write poems for special public occasions? <laughs> and I said, no, I really think you'd better find someone else. And they said, well, what would you do? <laughs> and I said that I also would like to um, read to people who couldn't otherwise have poetry. And um, I did read at prisons, old age homes, psychiatric hospital, um, some schools. And um, it, it, it just felt very good. Those, the people that I read to really seemed to feel a need for poetry in their lives, something that they didn't have, and that made it seem very worthwhile. Makes a difference, doesn't it? Yeah. If they're there because they want right. uh, to be there. Um, 
I, I had a good I had a good time too. Just I think mostly for that reason. Reed, what about what about you and your well, tenure? <coughs> one of the features of my career is that I don't remember it very well. Um, as I recall, uh, I don't know how I happened to become the poet laureate, but I do remember a nice ceremony in Annapolis where Governor Hughes was there. And you weren't there, I don't think. I, was, I think I was living in California. Yeah, you'd moved. And so I was, uh, I was all alone, except for some friends. And then I proceeded uh, rather informally to uh, speak at odd, odd moments. I don't think my, my career <laughs> was regularized in any way. One of the things I do remember, and it wasn't wholly pleasant, I was sitting on a platform, I think in Baltimore, a large public occasion, at which there was to be the awarding of a prize to a poet who was not necessarily a school poet, although it was in a school, but just a poet. And before the occasion, I had been asked uh, to vote for somebody and I had not voted for the one who got the prize. <laughs> <laughs> so I sat there silent on the stage for most of the occasion. That's what I didn't like. And I remember after the occasion and after the poem, the prize had been awarded to the wrong person. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't I, grumble, though. Huh? I didn't grumble, but I went up to the man I wanted to have the prize and thanked him. <laughs> <laughs> Did you, were you asked to write poems for special occasions? Yes, I think I was, now that you mention it, and I think I said no, yes. I, I no. wasn't. I thought it was understood that uh, I wouldn't do that. But mm -hmm. uh, sometime down the road, after I'd been in office a while, I was asked if mm -hmm. I felt like writing a poem for a particular thing, and I declined. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think it's, it's best if you write the poem when you haven't been asked. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Lucille? Well, I was appointed in 76, which is quite a long time ago, by Governor, um, by Governor Hughes. Mm -hmm. And it was a shock to me. I got a phone call, and uh, um, I thought it was a joke, actually. Uh, <laughs> I lived in Baltimore at the time, uh, and I now live in Columbia. Uh, and there was no ceremony or anything. I, and I've forgotten who else, went over and I shook his hand, and they took a picture, and then I went home. <laughs> and, but. Uh, I went into prisons. I wasn't asked about doing anything. I did go into prisons, and I, I visited almost all, if not all, of the counties uh, mm -hmm. in Maryland, which was very interesting, uh, because we're talking about almost 25 years ago. And the Poet Laureate was welcome in places that the African-American woman may not have been welcome. So I thought that was a very interesting mm -hmm. experience. A little tension. Huh? Yeah, well, it was interesting. I can recall one woman not noticing that there, <laughs> there wasn't anybody else who looked like me there, except for the people in the kitchen, who, when I began to talk, came out and listened in the doors and things, and I was waving, and it was great fun. I know you can be a little touchy about that, Lucy. Well, I'm testy sometimes. I, I remember <laughs> years ago, you are giving a reading someplace in Washington and saying, I'm tired of reading to all white faces. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I, st I was poet learned for quite a while, so I suppose it was all right. But I did in the beginning, I think I was asked about ceremonial poems, mm -hmm. and I did say I didn't do windows or ceremonial <laughs> poems. But I did write a poem for, the, I think it was the 350th anniversary. I wrote two poems, uh -huh. one that was a public poem mm -hmm. and one that was, uh, was a, a private poem. Mm -hmm. And uh, the public poem, I think, was a responsible poem, but the private poem was published uh, because the, uh, I must tell this story, the uh, theme, I think, was our happy colonial days. And uh, I now work in St. Mary's County, at St. Mary's College, which is, you know, the founding uh, colony of Maryland. But the poem that I wrote then was called Why They Be Mad at Me Sometimes. And it was, they asked me to remember but they want me to remember their memories, <laughs> and I keep on remembering mine. Uh -huh. <laughs> but uh, I enjoyed it very much. I went to senior citizens' homes, and uh, I went into the prison, and I went to children, because I write children's books. And more I than 30, I think, children's books. Uh, a fair number, over, altogether more than 30. Yeah. Did the rest mm -hmm. of you have to be sworn in? I remember that I had to swear to uphold the Constitution of the I United States correct. and the yes. Constitution of Maryland. I and I too. hadn't been warned. And 
I know the Constitution of the United States. That was easy, but as I was swearing to uphold the Constitution of Maryland, it occurred to me I didn't know what it even said. So I, I think that someone asked Governor Hughes if that should happen, and he had somebody reference it, and they said, no, it's okay. So I think we really just shook hands on the deal. I did. I swore to. You did. And, I, and I, 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 I was a little surprised, too. I didn't know until I got there that... Mm. I thought, what is this? Am I going to swear to suppress bad poetry? <laughs> does that include mine? Or what, what, what am I swearing to? Now that this has been brought, I do remember that I, I swore to something. But I also remember that Governor Hughes was very mild and pleasant about the whole mm -hmm. thing, so that I didn't think I was swearing. Well, the Glenn Dennings were very nice. I had a nice uh, ceremony. And if I wrote a poem for someone, it might be Mrs. Glenn Denning, who gave mm -hmm. signs unmistakable of having read some of my poems. <laughs> and uh, it was very nice. Mm -hmm. I know someone who was teaching in Germany, <clears throat> and he didn't want to play the, pay the church tax. So he was called into an office, <clears throat> and he had to raise his hand and swear that he was an unbeliever. <laughs> 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 but I, I love that part of putting yeah. his hand up and saying, <laughs> Ich bin ein Unglaube. <laughs> I'm, I'm an unbeliever. <laughs> so he got out of the church tax. I think <laughs> I did ask if Governor Hughes <clears throat> had read any of my work, and I think the answer was, I don't think so. <laughs> and I thought, well, that'll work. <laughs> that'll work. Yeah. Well, let's have a poem, huh? Um, we ended with you, Lucille. Shall we begin with you this time? Um, all right, if you'd like. Oh, this is, uh, this is a poem called Hag Riding. It's, it's sort of a fun poem. Uh, when I was young, people used to talk about, about uh, women who, in, at least in our neighborhood, this is in Buffalo, New York, where I grew up, uh, who were hag ridden. And I never knew what that meant, but I thought it must be great because they were wild looking women, and I always thought that was a special thing. Anyway, hag riding. Why is what I ask myself. Maybe it is the African in me still trying to get home after all these years. But when I wake to the heat of morning galloping down the highway of my life, something hopeful rises in me, rises and runs me out into the road, and I lob my fierce thigh high over the rump of the day, and honey, I ride. I ride. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. Oh, that's wonderful. Read. Uh, my uh, youngest child <coughs> got married just yesterday. Oh. So I have to honor that occasion by reading a poem about her when she was a little baby. This would be Daisy. This is Daisy. And at that time, I was only 49. <laughs> and so this is the girl in the next room. Baby girl, you have insomnia. I know. I am 49 times your age. I have insomnia. It brings us together. In there, what are you thinking? Softly, you woof, woof, like the neighbor's dog. Gently, your feet pound the crib like the moon's hammers. And now you are humming. But what are you thinking? In here, I, 49er, your comrade, am thinking darkly of moons and worlds and flesh, as old sleepless ones do softly. Do you have dark thoughts? I wish I could ask you and hear your reply in there, the two of us close and soft, far from the day. But if I went in, you would tease and not say. Mm. Lovely. Oh, she's yeah. still a nice girl. She's, <laughs> she's wonderful. I'm yeah. lucky enough to know her a little. She's yeah. quite wonderful. Yeah. I call her the daisiest. Yes. <laughs> Linda? Well, since we're sitting here, I was thinking that um, to be a famous poet is definitely an oxymoron. And this is um, a poem about what I think about fame in general. It's also a poem that I wrote um, after another drought summer followed by an autumn. Mm -hmm. It's called Fame. There will be no vivid colors this autumn. Because of the drought, they tell us, because the loyalties of weather are changing. The leaves will bow out without the usual fanfare. No curtain calls this time, no tide of tourists. They will simply fade and fall as we do, and one day sooner than last year be forgotten. Very nice. New, huh? Mm -hmm. Very nice. Well, um, 
I'm going to read one called 22691. <clears throat> well, mother, tomorrow night I will be born, if this were 57 years ago and you were 29. 29, how young you would be to me now, mother. A girl, were you still a girl at 29, having your fourth baby, your first after the miscarriage, me? If I'm thinking of you more, am I getting ready to be born again, or do I miss you from reading Juan Rulfo, who lets the dead son and mother talk the way we did so long, a month before you died, seven years, five months, and eight days ago, almost 50 years after that night we beat the doctor by 25 minutes or so. Remember? I don't, but you remembered it to me. Now I remember to you everything, the 40-watt bulb, the winter, you're holding me aside till the doctor came to cut the cord. That's a wonderful poem. I was born at home in uh, depression in North Dakota, and the doctor was, did arrive 25 minutes after I did. <laughs> well, uh, mm. Uh, I think we should uh, have another poem, and I think that would be a good way to uh, to close our our program. And uh, read one, uh, read one about his daughter, and I think I will uh, will also. And if if it's all right, we'll go back around this way, Linda. So you'll be next. This is called uh, Pamela, my daughter, who's uh, like Reed's grown up now, and I have her permission to read it. And it is, as we say, based on a true story. Praise for Pamela Helen Flint, who, when Rick's mother called to say her son was dying, left at once, expensively, to fly from Virginia to California to see him and, as it turned out, to be the only one with him when he died of AIDS at 27. Went because she's loved him since they were 14, maybe before either knew the complicated calls of sex, specific measures of need or predilection, but went on as each had promised each in love for life. And so just left school and job and kin, catching the first flight out, rented a car in Fresno, drove 50 miles to the hospital to be with him so he knew it, a wordless surge of greeting at her voice, crying and touch. May all who need one at the end have such a friend praise her. That's my baby. That is Linda? so moving. This is the first poem in my new book. It's called The Almanac of Last Things. From the almanac of last things, I choose the spider lily for the grace of its brief blossom, though I myself fear brevity. But I choose the song of songs because the flesh of those pomegranates has survived all the frost of dogma. I choose January with its chill lessons of patience and despair, and August too sunstruck for lessons. I choose a thimble full of red wine to make my heart race, then another to help me sleep. From the almanac of last things, I choose you, as I have done before. And I choose evening, because the light clinging to the window is at its most reflective, just as it is ready to go out. Um, Linda was too modest to say her most recent book is called Carnival Evenings, and it's uh, new and selected. And uh, Reed, what will you give us at last? Reed's new, uh, most recent book is called The Past, the Future, and the Present. And this is in the uh, section called The Present. <laughs> um, I'm, at the moment, rather interested in narrative poems, story poems. But here's an early version of it in which I'm dealing with this crucial matter in a narrative, suspense. What I am telling you now moves and must always be moving so that if it is in the kitchen, it must be drifting out into the hall and up the long stair as far perhaps as the attic 
or it must float out, float out toward the mountain where a fine lady, perhaps, is waiting. Yes, what I am telling you now is climbing the steep side, and an hour, perhaps, will do it to the top where the lady is waiting. For why would I tell you that which I tell you were there not always this movement, this drifting out from the attic onto the mountain and up the steep side? For were there not always this movement, you would be bored and drumming the kitchen table. But because you are hearing this drifting, you are now listening, waiting. Mm. Uh, That's wonderful. That's Lucille, wonderful. as they say in radio, why don't you take us on out? Lucille's <laughs> most recent book is called The Terrible Stories. And this is the first poem in the book, The Terrible Stories. It's called Telling Our Stories. The fox came every evening to my door, asking for nothing. My fear trapped me inside, hoping to dismiss her, but she sat till morning, waiting. At dawn, we would, each of us, rise from our haunches, look through the glass, then walk away. Did she gather her village around her and sing of the hairless moon face, the trembling snout, the ignorant eyes? Child, I tell you now it was not the animal blood I was hiding from. It was the poet in her, the poet and the terrible stories she could tell. And she does. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lucille. Thank all of you. Very nice and pleasant to sit with uh, old friends and read some poems and talk. And thank you for joining us on The Writing Life.